Okay, welcome to Film Animals Mainstream Representation Across Genres. Our first paper is by T Sir Tuthra Roy, um, Making and Breaking Non-Human Stereotypes, a Post-Anthropocentric Study of Zootopia, Back to the Outback, and the Bad Guys. Um, so please um, go ahead, um, Suturo. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Please go yeah, ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Good afternoon to all the panelists present here, rather a good more evening because it's like evening from where I'm presenting. My work centers around the popular depiction of non-human media, more specifically the animated film. I hope to delineate through my research how this medium has been more and more used in contemporary American filmmaking to recognize and address the stereotypes and biases with which we hold non-human animals, often subconsciously. As such, the three films I discuss are Zootopia, Back to the Outback, and The Bad Guys. The human ways of perceiving the non-human has been laden with dogma since the beginning of civilization, and fables highlight the presence of stereotypically clever foxes, proud lions, vain peacocks, and so on. As such, non-human animals in a myriad of depictions become signifiers with which we rethink our human world. Looking at the cunning fox, for instance, this bias is not only rooted in the threat posed by the creature towards poultry, but ties a primarily anthropogenic idea of cunningness with an actual creature in the wild to entwine the symbolic and the real in an often indistinguishable clump. Joe Wimpenny addresses this issue, stressing the importance of freeing our minds of cognitive biases regarding animals which predispose us to behave in a certain manner. At a time when so many animals are threatened, when we have already stacked odds against them by destroying their habitats, persecuting and hunting them, how unhelpful it is that we stick derogatory labels on some of them too, using them of character flaws that are based on human faults all along. Our brains can make connections before we have time to think about them. Mental shortcuts called heuristics that help to free up cognitive capacity for other things. It's an essential process that prevents information overload, helping us to make sense of the world. But it can also be a hindrance because these mental shortcuts are not always spot on. Zootopia attempts to rectify this very gaze on the fox through the character of Nick Wilde, who is introduced as a porn artist in due with the conventional depiction of foxes as strict stricter figures. However, this very act that Nick chooses for himself is a form of self-fulfilling prophecy that he worked himself into after a traumatic childhood experience where he was beaten up and muzzled simply because he was a fox and deemed to be cunning self-reflexively addressing the stereotypes with which we often behold the non-human world. Zootopia and its predator prey dynamic has often been read as an allegory about racial tensions in the to its civilized bipedal animals. Such allegories might not go far in enabling us to rethink our ideas of foxes, rabbits, sheep, cheetahs, or elephants, since we're sure, since we're secure in our idea that the fictionalist characters on screen are little more than human standards. For example, Clawhauser, the cheetah's depiction, is more likely to help us to rethink how we judge people by their appearances rather than alter our gaze on how we perceive actual cheetahs in the wild. However, this does not put a limit on the ethical and imaginative use of anthropomorphic animals, as positive portrayals of foxes cannot hurt if we remember Joe Pempenny's idea to stop symbolizing non-human animals as standing for negative traits. This is most evident in the portrayal of predators in Zootopia. Disney has often depicted big cats as savage scheming predators like the ones often existing in popular imagination. For example, the pictures of Sabor the villainous leopard in Tarzan and Sheikh Khan, the royal football tying in its jungle book on the screen. However, in Zootopia, the conventionally predatory animals like the lion, male lionheart, and the cheetah, claw hazard, highlight more benevolent and humanized depictions of the same. In the very justified portfolio, we see two kinds of depictions, a testament to how animation becomes a double-edged sword can be used to both defy popular conventions as well as succumb and adhere to it. As such in Zootopia, the non-human animals espouse conservationist tendencies by simply existing in a diverse, colorful world that appeals to our biophilic tendencies. Kevin Chu notes that despite the lack of explicit con conservationist tendencies, the vibrant depiction of animal life expresses and nurtures a utopian desire for the latter's preservation, such that the spectral animal images also create the possibility 
for animal life to establish an effective bind with the human pure, to sleep out with allegory, to nurture a utopian desire for the latest preservation. This points to one of the greatest aspects of animated films, which use the non-human animals POV, uh, because the very squash and stretch techniques enable the use of animals in animation as symbols to think with as a fitting missile. However, Chu also notes that the marked absence of reptiles and birds in the film point to a form of extra, extra diegetic space speciesism, the directorial decision to include certain characters or creatures at the expense of others. This points to a common, common species trend in films where mammalian bodies since they lend more easily to anthropomorphism by their expression of spatial tics and eye placements have mostly been used in popular media. Whereas reptiles, amphibian fish, and invertebrates have received the short end of the stick. This points to a central fallacy of conservation that certain mammalian species, that Ursula Heisey, that adopts this charismatic megafauna, become the mascots of conservation, as such more funds campaigning in attention and they've diverted to the disappearing rhinoceroses, whales, tigers, pandas, okapis, and macaws, as opposed to the vast number of reptiles, insects, and fish, which have also begun disappearing to nature. Ursula Heise remarks that certain species, uh, the sheer size and the perceived majesty and fierceness of major predators make it easy to pass them in narratives of tragic falls from grace. Certain species, in other words, lack the cultural standing that may make them tragic or elegiac figures. In fact, such species ideas subtly inform animated media, such that animated films, the currently dominant form of expression for the non-human non point of view, in the double-edged sword where different kinds of biases play a role. But at the same time, as seen in the aforementioned example, the medium can also be used to self-reflexively address and pose a counter against the same biases. Zootopia does this very thing while simultaneously reinforcing certain biases while attempting to counter others. However, other films remain chauffeured with such non-humans, what we consider the pests, the bugs, and the scary reptiles and sharks to a more benevolent gaze, representing them as heroic characters. Thus, instances are evident in Rango where the seeming ugliness of creatures, normally considered grotesque, makes them suitable to represent them as part of a wild, harsh Wild west landscape. Similarly, in Over the Hedge, which focuses on the struggles of a group of urban animals, traditionally considers pests to survive by highlighting their point of view, their familial structures and effective capacities. They yeah, offer a different narrative than the anthropocentric construction of pestifying them, if I may coin a term. Similarly, various insects appear in films like A Bug's Dive, Ants, B-Movie, and The Ant Bully, while sharks are often regarded as variable features in stories like Finding Nemo and Shark Tale. However, the purpose of this study is not to look at these instances, but rather ones that self-reflexively and consciously point to the biases which we have against some species, rather than simply representing them as many wooden characters on screen. Such films feature these scared creatures existing in a world with humans, where the human gaze on them metanarratively reflects our own, bringing them out to be more potent instruments than Zootopia, where humans are lacking, pointing to an inability to highlight this metanarrative race gaze to a mediating agency. The first of these films, The Bad Guys, features a group of misunderstood animals, a wolf, a snake, a spider, a shark, and a piranha, turned to a life of crime because they believe that being evil is the only way for members of the species to live highlighting a form of self-fulfilling prophecy that had been born of years of discrimination. The very picture on the screen is the attempt to run away after a heist, while two of the most memorable quotes by the central characters highlight the central theme. We were never given a chance to do anything but second-rate criminals. And in another instance, how can we say that they are hopeless if they have never been given a chance? This discrimination is evident when Mr. Snake, that is how he's referred throughout, where he talks about how no one attempted to befriend him and even did not show up for his birthday party simply because he was a snake. The strangely parallels Snake's discrimination in Zootopia that he faced for his peers while attempting to join the junior rangers. This film interestingly adopts a post anthropocentric approach, tackling the gaze of the non human by linking animals associated with ugliness, danger, or evil with human ideas of criminals and criminality. As such, the story features not only the attempts, the non-human animals to redeem themselves, but also the human characters to embrace them as part of the society. This is most evident in the fact that the villain is a guinea pig, creature caricaturized as being the manifestation of goodness to works with an ulterior motive to frame that titular bad guys. One thing, however, that links 
uh, Zootopia and the bad guys together is that the non-human animals are often depicted as bipedal creatures very close, who are often more human than non-human, how they negotiate with spaces and the surroundings. Both of them use allegorizations to different degrees. Furthermore, the use of allegorization at times impedes looking at the non-human animals being depicted. They become simple stand-ins for human beings, but the conservationist tendencies, despite being present, are limited by the very anthropomorphism of these non humans Anthropomorphism has often come under attack for showing unrealistic sides of the non-human by imposing human characters, but such attributes can also act in a humanizing attempt that seeks to bridge a gap between the human and non-human subjectivities. Matters how the anthropomorphism is done. Whereas both Zootopia and the bad guys look at the discriminatory human gaze of the non-human, they are limited by the humanized nature of the character. For the last section, we turn to back to the outback, which too engages in anthropomorphism but to a vastly aesthetic. Characters here are a lizard, a venomous type and snake, a funnel with spider and a scorpion, all of whom are ex exoticized as dangerous animals kept at the zoo in Australia. They realize how human beings perceive them as demonized, dangerous creatures as opposed to the cuddly koala kept at the same zoo, which is named Pretty Boy. Over a series of conflicts, they attempt to escape to their home in the outback, kidnapping Pretty Boy in the process as he slowly emerges to be the ally. The co-director of the film, Harry Pips, explicitly regards his desire to use a type of snake, which, despite being one of the most venomous snakes in the world, has never been recorded to have killed a human being because of the shy personalities. Marry the Taipan, this film, manifests this very dilemma by being showcased as a gentle and loving character who has to fight of stigma like her other friends. Even Pretty Boy realizes how the human's love for him is prone to a 180 degrees reversal, seen in the one instance that he is perceived as rabid, rabid and his furry appearance, often used to make him appear cute before audiences, is used to demonize him. As such, all non-humans, big, small, mammalian or insect, depicted according to whims of human beings, something that this film metanarratively critiques. Over time, the characters come across various other members of the ugly animal society, the, a society self-reflexively and metanarratively pointing to the desire of the film to look at the biases which we have against non-humans in order to rethink the same. Members of this society include sharks, toads, and even a giant saltwater crocodile. Misunderstood non-humans, which regularly appear in feature features or animal attack movies. As such, the three films discussed above, discussed above posit the very conundrum of representing the non-human in three stages, where in Zootopia, it metanarratively addresses the biases against different mammals by means of allegory before going on to the bad guys, where such allegorization is overtaken by self-reflexive addressal for actual biases towards non-human creatures, or finally concluding it back to the outback, where the non-human animals are not bipedal clothed, humanized characters, but demonized vermin of the non-human world, whose journey metanarratively reflects the crit critical animal studies scholars' desire to pose a countergate to speciesist frameworks and reconceptualize non-human ontological biases from the human case. Here is the list of references that I've used as an early career scholar. I would be I really appreciate any form of feedback that you might have to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Tutha, for a very organized and insightful uh, presentation that basically starts off our, our, our session very well. Um, we'll Thank now you. move to the second paper, uh, which is being presented by Fabiana Deste and Luca Leonardo, uh, the Istituto Zuprovlatica Sperimenta del Venezia. I apologize for my Italian. Uh, their paper is The Cinematic Animal from an Object of Vision in Mainstream American Cinema to Subject of Vision in Contemporary Cinematic Experiences. Um, so um, without, Hello. ah, you are there together. Um, yes. Buongiorno. Hello. Hello. Oh, no, it's in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, off you go. Okay. Sorry. Can you, Are you seeing the you share see the, screen button you, at the bottom? Okay. Can you see the the, um, the presentation? The presentation is now started. Yes, oh, I can see it now. Thank you. Sorry. For, so uh, the starting point is the vision, the dominant vision of the non-human animal in classic cinema and other media that reflects an anthropocentric vision. 
And uh, so the aim of this presentation is rethinking the new human animal from a post-humanistic point of view and uh, recovering the condition of being an animal common to human and non-human. So uh, we have considered the, the following theoretical frameworks, uh, the ecological post-humanism theory, uh, according to the theory of the philosopher and theologist Roberto Marchesini, that uh, this, the, discusses the, the, the self-referentiality of human uh, and uh, they aim to recover the condition uh, of being an original animal common to human and non-human. Uh, animal welfare studies and uh, contributes the contribution of science uh, uh, um, in the recognition of non-human animals as sentient beings. Uh, one third vision that uh, recognize, recognize the health of people linked, connected to the health of animals and, uh, uh, and uh, our uh, shared environment. And so uh, for the last, the, uh, the cinematic graphic language uh, that uh, uh, as, um, uh, as interested to the relationship between human and non-human in uh, cinema, obviously. So uh, the main question uh, is it uh, becomes, is it possible to look at the non-human animal from an anthropo a non-anthropocentric perspective? So uh, we try to rethink uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, representation, this non-human animal representation. And we take some examples um, of American mainstream cinema in which the anthropocentric gaze is more evident and other experimental cinematographic experiences that seek another type of gaze and switches from object of vision to subject of vision. Oh, so. And uh, we have identified two main lines of representation of the new human animal in Hollywood cinema based on a process of anthropomorphism. The new human animal as a monster and the non human animal as a mirror. And, uh, and so the non human uh, animal as a monster is a, uh, the result of a process of animalization of human, in which uh, human loses is, is uh, uh, called uh, any uh, human uh, human qualities and acquires a, a new human characteristic this is the case of vampires creatures hybrids and then uh, this means an overload of bad instincts but at the same time this overload of evil instincts also involves the non-human self which is in fact transformed into a monster so uh, the non-human animal as a mirror is a result uh, of a process of humanization, uh, complete um, humanization of the non-human, uh, capable of experience, experiencing uh, feelings and emotions that, uh, that is a uh, human. And then it, it becomes a mirror of human. So, uh, at the, an example at the beginning of the history of cinema is emblematic. In electrocuting an elephant, uh, we can see uh, what distinguishes the monster animal uh, that is a clear separation between human and non-human, and uh, in which human feels superior and desires his dominion over the, the non-human animal. And so um, it, it, this characterizes uh, the cinematic genre of animal horror. In fact, where, when you, uh, you uh, find an act of transgression uh, of the non-human animal, it is, is uh, always a violation of human rules. And, and, and then it, the consequence is, uh, it, is the, that uh, non-human is punished or killed. So a part of the film of this genre is King Kong, a symbol of a threat to be killed. And then we have uh, a list of things uh, to Devil Bat for, uh, uh, and uh, all the supernatural monsters as werewolves, vampires, and all creatures. And, um, so if the violation of human uh, in, uh, as 
always or as often the same conclusion, human prevails of the animal using, using lethal weapons. It's the, it's the, it's the case of uh, films like uh, Tarantula, Jaws, or Grizzly, for example. <clears throat> and then there is a, a great list of films in, the, in, this, uh, in this direction. And so the non-human animal as a mirror um, is characterized for the similarities and affinities of the non-human to human. So uh, it, it feels a, a feeling of empathy. And this is, humanization is, uh, is uh, longer, <laughs> is, is uh, very, very, uh, very strong because uh, the anthropocentric perspective in this process is not limited to considering animals as humans, but also to selecting which non-human animals can be worthy of empathy from the human point of view. So it's a, it's a case of uh, Pets, it's a film, uh, emblematic film, uh, because the humanization is very complete, very strong. <clears throat> but uh, uh, even in this case, uh, we have uh, a, a long show, a long list of uh, and, uh, a list of films. Well, in the uh, uh, world of Disney is a rather emblematic example, but even uh, in the anti-Disney uh, animated film, Tex uh, Avery or Shrek, we have the same conclusion. We have a complete humanization of human, uh, of a non-human animal. Zootopia, uh, we have already seen, already considered, you know? Yes, mm, the most new, uh, so the from object to savage of vision. If the monster non-human and the mirror non-human show a non-human as object of, of human vision is, uh, is, take, is uh, possible uh, thanks to a traditional or, class or classical time and space conception. Uh, the, uh, that favor the human perspective. We, uh, we can think to the strong use of film editing, of uh, uh, particular shots, of staging of the film. So, and uh, mm, we have considered for, for the, for, uh, for the uh, changes, for switching to uh, subject of vision. To, uh, we have considered uh, slow cinema, that is a, you know, a, a recent approach uh, of, the of, of the contemporary cinema. Uh, that aims of going beyond the traditional non-human representation uh, because uh, it starts from the need to slow down the viewing time. It tends to use uh, the, the use of the fixed shots and sequence shots uh, uh, allows us to live times, rhythm of vision and spaces uh, that bring us uh, back to the human gaze uh, and tries another type of gaze. Uh, the time flow is not interrupted as uh, in the narrative cinema. And then a human in a non-narrative non space and time has the possibility of being subject. It recalls uh, the less difference uh, between image time and image movement and Bazin's early uh, theory. And uh, these uh, uh, examples uh, are uh, characteristic, the Turing also, the four times, uh, bovine, bestiaire, nenet. Um, for example, the horse of the uh, protagonist of the Turing horse becomes a figure of death and non and immobility, thanks to use of long shots or second shots that uh, slow, uh, slows the, the viewing time. In bovines, for example, the viewing time becomes the, the, uh, the time uh, of daily uh, ruminating cows, or the, the daily life of ruminating cows, and then reproduce uh, the, what Deleuze defines time image as a direct representation of time. In four times, we, 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 find, uh, we can find human, plants, mineral, no human, all 
all positioned uh, on, on the same level. And so uh, in a net or becoming animal, Bunda, we have example uh, where the, the, the use of uh, immersive uh, shooting uh, led us to uh, decentralize uh, the gaze, the human gaze. Um, let us uh, to, to emerge in the experience of nature. So Marquezini speaks of no human epiphany because uh, uh, each entity announces a widespread feeling that goes beyond the manifest manifestation of oneself. So Animal Sinner, for the last example we propose, uh, is a short film edited by the by uh, using uh, videos uploaded to YouTube in which the protagonists are non-human that uh, interact with uh, with the cameras casually, and that, and this is a, a stream and a visual experiment of the centralized case. <clears throat> so the the partial conclusion of this part of this propose of this approach. Um, is a different concept of time. Time becomes the time of nature, ritual, repetitive, uh, cyclical. And uh, uh, if the time nature changes, so does the, uh, the position of, of uh, the human. And then a different concept of space, uh, because the close up, full length uh, framing are left for the use of long shot which break down the boundaries of hierarchical order. We have considered this uh, as uh, such as attempts at a new vision of the non-human, the process of liberation from anthropomorphism is uh, only at the beginning, is a partial obvious. So we have, we have these conclusions. Uh, in example from the mainstream cinema, monster and mirror categories, uh, we have a, a, a strong use of staging and a strong use of classical narrative film editing. And on the, on the ontological level, human and non-human are in the, uh, at the, on the different level. So uh, we have the, the human at the top, it's, it's a vertical uh, architecture. So in the this example from experimental cinema, we have a minimization of staging and a minimization of editing. And human and non-human have a, 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 a same level or are positioned on the same level. Uh, we have a distribution, a horizontal distribution. This is the, uh, our conclusion to use a simile. It can be said that in the representation of non-human, the difference between mainstream and experimental cinema is like that between intensive farming and extensive farming. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Fabiano um, and Luca, for a very clear representation of theory, um, pointing to where um, representations of animals can go. Um, so I think that will work very well for our conversation. Um, and now we will move to our next paper. Um, and that is David Sedman from Southern Methodist University. And his paper is entitled Forgotten Animals of the Silent Film, Menagerie Era of Comedy Shorts. Uh, thank you. I, I hope you can all hear me and, and welcome we to the conference. We can hear and see you. This is great. And speaking of great, Fabiano and Luca, that was absolutely terrific. Um, talking about um, animals mirroring the ideal human is actually what um, part of my presentation is about. So that's outstanding. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'll be talking about the forgotten animal stars of the uh, silent film menagerie period. Uh, some may be quite familiar with these and others maybe not so much, but um, animal comedies kind of hit their, um, their prime 
during um, the, the 1920s and studios with menageries included, but are not limited to uh, Selig Polyscope, which was known for its William Fox uh, comedies and it's, it had its own zoo. Uh, MGM, which had the uh, best known of the menageries. Century Films uh, for Universal, they probably made the most films. Uh, they made them cheaply and quick. And e &R Jungle Pictures, which um, allowed people to come on their studio to shoot independents like uh, Tarzan was shot on the e &R Jungle Pictures, but they had their own uh, stables of stars as well. In terms of the, uh, the silent period, these movies could be based around dogs and horses and mules and lions and primates and a whole lot more. Uh, ostriches come to mind. Uh, they existed in which um, an era in which the cinematic apparatus sustaining the production of animal narratives and animal stars through organized systems of regulations, production and promotion, and through the employment of recognizable patterns of editing, um, narrative and genre, where the representation was established as a major facet of the cinema production ecosystem. And that comes from Claire McCoy's uh, Malloy's rather, uh, popular media and animals. Now, some of these um, stars, they made their transition from vaudeville to film. So a number of the animal stars um, came out of vaudeville, they learned tricks that were helpful, and they became very helpful in their film roles. Uh, you can think of uh, like Little Hip and Napoleon. Um, Little Hip is actually the elephant, and uh, Napoleon is sometimes called Napoleon the Great, um, is a, a chimpanzee. And there they are together with Professor Anderson, and they would go from city to city. Unfortunately, when they did a, um, a tour in, in Australia, um, unfortunately, uh, Little Hip died and was decided to team up um, Napoleon with Sally. And so they decided to move from vaudeville to film, which was a good move. Uh, Pal the Wonder Dog also went from doing vaudeville acts on the Keith Orpheum, uh, Keith and Orpheum stages um, to Century Comedy's Menagerie and then broke out as a star there. And just to show you what this might have looked like, um, this is a 1916 film of Napoleon and Sally performing. Uh, and that's John Ronan, the trainer. And if you put a dime in the box or a nickel as a kid, the, they would do this kind of act. And it's kind of a short act. And I would think over time, it's got a little bit old. <laughs> and so Ronan decided uh, with his wife, uh, Elizabeth, to put the two into uh, starring roles in film. Other animals that were in the menagerie, uh, then they just simply broke out, uh, like Queenie, uh, the Wonder Horse, or a bunch of the dogs, like Brownie the dog, Teddy the dog, Maud the mule. They were kind of bit players, and they were so good at what they did, Century went ahead and elevated them into a series of films. The scripts were built around human-centric tricks that were taught to, the, taught to these animal performers. For instance, um, in the case of Napoleon and Snooky, uh, they were able to operate vehicles. So sometimes they were the family chauffeurs. Um, they also went off to war because they were pretty good at handling guns and shooting the guns. They could shoot them without, I guess, panicking themselves too much. And so that, that worked out. Uh, Brownie and Pal were both labeled as wonder dogs, and they were generally performing human roles. They were uh, hotel clerks, they were police detectives, babysitters, and of course, everybody's favorite, Mahjong coach, um, which here we see uh, Brownie really kind of taking task, Harry Sweet's poor play in Mahjong. As far as the animal star goes, um, the star kind of becomes uh, a kind of a myth mythical divine status that's conferred upon um, you know, stars that are human, but in this case can be conferred upon um, animal stars. And that comes from a starification of cinematic animals um, by Stella Hockenhole. Uh, Snookums has a complete bio, Snooky. Um, he is the offspring of uh, Napoleon and Sally. Uh, such a perfectionist that he demands a retake if the shot is not right, as Snooky should. 
Uh, Dr. X also says that this is the smartest chimpanzee on the planet. Now the doctor's last name changes every single time. So I'm not sure which doctor this is, but you know, very smart. But in actuality, Snooki, Snooki was a female actress and was revealed after um, Sally was out of the industry. I said, well, actually Snooki is, is a female. Um, but my point is that having a mythical bio, just like a normal human star, if you will, lends the starification of each studio's true stable of stars. In terms of promotion, uh, you can see on the uh, upper right, um, there's Snooki on the cover of um, uh, Picture Weekly, which apparently um, Snooki reads to make sure that Snooki is either featured or not featured. And if he is not featured, or in this case, she is not featured, um, a note is sent to the publicist saying, you know, where am I? But here making the cover. Uh, men of science also say that Snooki uh, possesses the highest grade of intelligence in apedom. Uh, Pal the dog is concluded by all who's observed him to be the most intelligent creation on four legs that has ever faced the camera. Queenie the educated horse uh, is a state of perfection, becomes so smart and because of her uncanny cleverness that in cured, she plays a veterinarian. I mean, that's pretty smart. Uh, Century also had bios for its Century Lions, Ethel, uh, Ethel uh, Caesar, Brutus, along with the trainer, uh, Bill Strecker. Uh, Teddy the dog had such a degree of intelligence that even the trainers never dreamed that things he could do were possible. And uh, all the director must do is call camera and Teddy will perform with the talent of a human actor, which is actually quite true. He's really good. Promotion, uh, having uh, become almost human, Napoleon Sally indulge in uh, coffee daily, cigarettes three times a day, beer, and Napoleon takes a small drink of hard liquor every now and again. Uh, the chimpanzees live their daily life much the same as humans, except possibly it is a little bit better uh, in their existence. They have special time for everything. And like any traditional movie star, they appeared on uh, at uh, movie premieres and they also had free promotional postcards. Sometimes they had uh, their prints on them. Uh, like this one you see from 1916. Uh, Brownie uh, wrote a telegram to a guy by the name of Reef Peters uh, where his movie was playing and said, hey, it would be great if the kids could come for free and bring their dogs and you know, House Peters was so impressed that Brownie had written this telegram that, um, you know, it, it packed him in, as you can see here, um, for, hum you know, in, the, in support of human hearts. So that was really good. And it's kind of where the human animal boundaries and interactions are kind of odd in 1920s uh, promotion of these animal stars. And, you know, that's actually pal, not Brownie, couldn't really find a picture of uh, Brownie typing, but, you know, they worked at the same studio. So it's possible that pal may have actually typed this and Brownie just took the credit, I'm not sure. In terms of positioning, Brownie, you know, he's a technologically savvy dog, let's face it. In 1920, he was already using radio. In his first year, there was a radio station and he used his tail as an antenna, as well as this pack when he went out and uh, kind of did his dog transmissions. Uh, now that's set apart from Pal, who's at the same studio. Pal was actually a daredevil stunt dog in the Buster Keaton mode. Didn't mind getting injured apparently. Not sure how we know this, but he gets injured quite often on the set, lost a tooth in a, in a scene where he's turning a doorknob and said, you know, it's just part of the job. He also set the dog record for most parachute jumps. So you probably should jot that down. And then Teddy, Max Sennett's Wonder Dog, moved from $35 to $350 a week, and he was paid among Sennett's highest paid human actors. And the point there is that he's such a good actor, and he really was, uh, that he deserved as much as a human actor. Um, let's take a look at uh, Snooky in action here in Just In Time as a chauffeur. It's kind of interesting because he's fired. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that these policies were uh, written down, but uh, basically uh, he's discharged for smoking on the duty. And um, he's so outraged by this and the treatment of the animals that Snooky uh, not only leaves the job, but says, hey, you don't treat me well, and you also don't treat somebody else well. And that is the the family's pet dog and proceeds to go in and, and say, I'm taking the dog with me as well because this, this place is no place to be. There, there's something actually is interesting though because their baby gets kidnapped and Snooky not only helps the family, gets the, uh, um, uh, the dog back, the kid back and gets his job back, I might point out. Sorry if that's a spoiler. Um, in terms of bios, the animals have birth dates, families, off-camera lights, lives, we even find out they might be injured or on strike in the case here on the right where um, that's Pal the Wonder Dog with uh, one of his sons. And he says, I'm on strike until this person gets a role in my next uh, film. And, you know, it kind of worked. 
I guess. Uh, supposedly two of Powell's pups, Pete the, Pete, Pete the Pup 1 and Pete the Pup 2. Pete the Pup 1 is on the left there in the Buster Brown comedies, and Pete the Pup 1 and 2 were both in the Buster Brown, uh, the, the Little Rascals movies, I'm sorry. Uh, supposedly Pete the Pup 1 was poisoned, and I know that Harry Lusaney, who's the trainer there, was killed in a, a gambling um, game, so kind of a rough life if I may. But let's take a look a little bit at Powell in action here. This is Mind the Baby, it's terrific. Uh, this is Powell, the owner says she uh, wants, and, and mother of a kid says, hey, I wanna go for a boat ride. Can you, you know, mind the baby while I'm doing this? And, you know, Powell says, sure, why not? Uh, unfortunately, through no fault of his own, uh, the, the baby ends up in the uh, local creek and there's a crocodile. And so uh, what happens is, first of all, uh, uh, Powell's got to go rescue the baby. He does a fantastic job, in my opinion. Uh, gets the baby to shore, gets the baby out, and decides the baby needs dry clothes. Unfortunately, while going to get the dry clothes, an alligator obviously comes out and attacks the baby. Uh, Powell, Powell's quick about this, though. Quickly getting to change clothes, running back. Obviously, there's trouble. You can tell from that scene. And then uh, fights an actual cro crocodile. There, this is really well shot. There's an actual crocodile in this that's it, snapping its tail and so forth. Kind of an interesting thing that happens here that saves the baby. The crocodile actually kind of helps out by removing the wet clothes here. And the kid, as any kid would do, uh, watches Pal and the crocodile in great joy. And then uh, Pal will vanquish the uh, crocodile, fortunately, and then bring dry clothes. And this all works out pretty well. It's a really good film if you haven't seen it. Uh, the Menagerie stars are given very sp superficial coverage in the academic press. There are several creed reasons for this. One is that the A animal stars of the period, the Strong Hearts, Rin Tin Tin, Lass and then Lassie in the, uh, in the sound era, had more lasting appeal. Large parts of the body of the work of these silent animals considerably, I mean, they're just lost or missing. Uh, documentation on IMDb tends to be incomplete and in some places totally missing. And a lot of times, incredibly accurate. If you want to look up Pal the Wonder Dog, you'll see a picture of a collie. That, that's clearly not right. Uh, these type of animal shorts are simply not made anymore is another reason. I don't think they get much coverage. And then uh, Michael, in his article on uh, animals in American television, noted that you know these kind of types of stars, it's a really great issue, you haven't uh, checked it out, really were on kind of early television as well. And also these animal stars reflect a period prior to the American humane presence on film sets. So they had a really interesting and rough life, uh, you know, five days on the set, that sort of thing. It's kind of the end of an era. Uh, Alice uh, Tidsley writing in 1930 in the newspaper said the day of the dog movie star was presumed to be definitely over when talking pictures became popular. Animals uh, on stages were simply uh, too noisy. They wrecked the microphone with their yelps, uh, whether behind or in front of the cameras. And they, you know, basically uh, when quiet please it sounded, the, the human actors could be quiet, but the animals couldn't. So what's the message of the menagerie as we kind of conclude here in the period of silent film? Well, uh, Brett Mills in the cultural myth-making of, um, of the human discussed the, um, the categories of animal roles and representation, the human animal boundaries and interactions. And the underlying storyline of these silent animal comedies is that animals take on the ideal role to help humans, despite humans not really providing the same ideal role model in return to the animal. The anthropocentric messaging in the film is that animals uh, basically take the human-centered thinking reactions and roles that one could best imagine for an animal. But in today's film industry, that would be more traditionally conveyed through robotic animals, animated animals, CGI animals, human mocap, which uh, happened in what uh, Man on the Moon with the kangaroo uh, uh, that they j just came out here in America last week. And uh, most frequently though, not at all, the animals don't have the same role. So uh, basically that's, uh, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, in, uh, in the early sound period, I can also point out that the animals talkies of the late 1920s and early 1930s were troop centered um, things. They didn't have stars uh, so much as they had troops and they were replaced by human actors and their voices. So a very different approach, um, kind of ending this menagerie period. And that's my presentation. Thanks so much uh, for, for listening. 
Thank you very much, David. And it was, you know, wonderful timing that you sort of entered right after the previous paper. So we are sort of getting this nice historical view. Um, and so now we will move on to the last paper in our session. Um, and that is Tianren Yilo. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the, for the names. Um, Tianren, I hope you will um, present your full name properly for us. Um, and you're here from us. Um, from the uh, University of China, uh, Fudan University, and your paper is titled The Crisis of Representations of Animals in American Popular Films. Um, Tianran, if you could go ahead, please. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you just great. Okay, and, yeah, yes, thanks. Have your presentation. Oh, yes, yes, I will start my presentation, and I think today I will co present it with my uh, colleague, Xiao Qing and he will give you the second part, and I will do the first part and third part. And this research comprises three parts. The first part briefly reviews the rigid animal-human dichotomy in Western theory and challenges this dichotomy. The second part will analyze through Zootopia, where elements constitute the representational exclusive inclusion of animals. In the final section, we explore a possible way of living with human animals. And the first part, animal-human dichotomy. First, we will provide a brief history of how animals are conceived and how they are distinguished from human beings, excluded from human communities in the Western history of thought. As we all know, Whitehead and his followers first discerned that Western metaphysics based on a series of dichotomies, and from our perspective, it should be underscored that the dichotomy between animals and humans should be added to this repertoire. However, in this part, due to the limit of time, we are only allowed to discuss three key moments in this tradition. The first is represented by Aristotle during the heyday of the classic world. The second, which is deemed as the jungle of the modern area, is by Descartes. And the third, the dusk of modernity, is represented by Heidegger. And we will find that animals are represented only through the fact and they are strictly separated from and distinguished from human beings. From these experts, it seems obvious Aristotle distinguished humans from animals, for the former soul comprised a higher part namely the calculative part, which the later does not enjoy. Or to put it differently, humans have cognitive faculties and are thus capable of reasoning, while animals are merely driven by their passion and impulses. Animal souls are termed as sensitive souls, while human souls are deemed rational souls. Here, humans are differentiated from animals through the privilege they are endowed with. To be a human is to demonstrate the ability to perform something animals cannot, and vice versa, to be an animal is to be somehow inferior or somehow imperfect compared with human beings. And we will see this Aristotelian view in, is recurrent in the representation of animals in the Western tradition. Animals are represented. And for Descartes, the state to distinguish animal from is thought, or to be more precise, self-consciousness. Descartes admits that animals are capable as humans of performing some given tasks or even better which means that if we only focus on the corporeal level, the boundary between animals and humans is undecidable. To truly distinguish animals from humans, we must underscore that humans are not merely composed of bodies that strictly follow mechanical rules. Instead, humans have souls which can move the body spiritually rather than physically. Or to employ the Christian term, humans make motions through two separate principles, while physical one is spiritual one. Well, the motion of animals only conform to the physical one. Here, the interesting thing is that the principle opposing human to animals is somehow invisible. Indeed, it is not easy to discern whether dogs, horses, and monkeys rarely perform tasks without thought or self-consciousness, since Descartes himself proposed a famous dilemma about the undecidability of the other being a merely mechanically manipulated puppet or zombie, or being an authentic subject with self-consciousness, so just like us. The dichotomy here is faced with a fatal challenge. We will return to this point later. Heidegger in his lecture, The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, famously or notoriously maybe, place animal in between human and lifeless inorganic things. Humans have a full access to the world and their world forming. And at the same time, inorganic things like a tree or a stone are totally deprived of the world, wordless. However, animals which occupy the place in between humans and inorganic things are neither world forming nor wordless. Instead, they are poor in words. It is not the task of this article to fully articulate what Heidegger tends to mean through this employing the terms. The only thing I want to emphasize here is that the economy between human and animals seemingly always accompanied by another supplementary trichotomy, 
for Aristotle, the division between human and animals is only complete when the plant is added. Therefore, there is not a no more dichotomy, but a hierarchy ascending from plants to humans through animals, from nutritive soul to rational cells through sensitive soul. For Heidegger, as we demonstrated above, the animal are located in the middle of human and inorganic beings. Therefore, the representation of animals through the dichotomy is not sufficient since it has to be accomplished by a third party. Otherwise, we will be forced in the dilemma faced with Descartes in which the borderline between animals and humans are undecidable. This perhaps is the crisis of, for the representation of animals in Western thought we have talked about above. For the conventional Western thinkers, on the one hand, the introduction of animals is necessary since they need animals to guarantee the preeminence of human beings. While on the other hand, in enacting such a dichotomy between humans and animals, they eventually come up with an aphoria in which animals cannot be unambiguously differentiated from human beings in an interest way. In other words, while the traditional Western thinkers attempt to represent animals as the other of human beings, they eventually are forced to acknowledge that animals as the other is more intimate with human beings than what they have claimed. Therefore, this embarrassing state makes the representation of animals being involved in their works while very quickly being avoided. And this is very different from the case of contemporary culture industry, in yeah. which the representation of animals does not take the form of the intimate other of human beings beings, but rather as the projection of human beings themselves. So let's uh, ask Xiao Qing to do the first part, yeah. to do, do the second um, part. Yeah, and here we uh, we must point out that there are already a large number of modern films and animes. Uh, I'm sorry, can, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, like animes, uh, or novels that we read this tendency towards uh, as a promorphic animal, not as another such as Beasters, uh, Beastars, to Octavius, and the numerous many films such as Gallery of the Galaxy, pop culture differs from traditional Western thoughts, which excludes animals by treating them as another. Uh, the form, on the contrary, uh, anthropomorphic animals, and uh, the anthropomorphic uh, model of animal representations we see as a report response uh, to the human animal uh, Diochronomy and an awkward one that face breaks because it fails to take into account animality itself. In such pop culture works, traces of anthropocentrism can be clearly observed. Human relationships are generous to all areas, to the world, and encompassing rabbits, foxes, sloths, rats, trees, and even worms. In other words, in popular animal anime or movies, uh, the worlds of animal and humans exist at the same time and are embedded in each other, which also implies its opposite. The worlds of animal and humans do not exist. There are no non-human animals and there are no humans who are different from animals. There is a human intersubjectivities, a magazine of representation of human relationships. And specifically, we here use the utopia to show how in American popular uh, culture, human so social relations are projected onto animals in order to represent them and constitute the exclusion of the continent of animals at another. So in Zootopia, we can first get a connotation from its names, Utopia of Animals or Utopia of Zoo. That is, all the animals create a utopian city in this film, where the order is apparent. Not only the relationships between animals are human rules, but also the existence of professional promotion and work status family relations and advanced infrastructure, uh, infrastructures, reality enhanced visions of science, friendship, and love from the backdrop of the utopia of anthropomorphic animals. We intentionally introduce here another real world utopia belonging to animals, the zoo, both things in which the harmony planning of animals and their habitants, while in the zoo, the animals are sorted and placed as much as possible in their bionic and nature environment those better presenting a perfect nature landscape to humans, even though the nature is played by with by humans, do reverse a utopia control of animals by humans, it match the rhetoric of do advocates, do helps animals survive better because humans provide uh, them with the perfect ration of food, calorie, and exercise they need. And in the utopia, we identify another uh, human imagination of uh, animal relationships that are of a completely anthropomorphic animal society. 
obviously at the beginning in the anima, uh, this is a per perfect utopia. Everywhere the illusion of harmony between animals, a modern anim animal city where each animal had its own uh, residence, a Sahara school with a desert climate, a glassy town where it is always cold, and in other words, an animated visual of do with anime autonomy. Animals live together peacefully here, while elephants or monks, as long as they work hard, they can make a name for themselves. And the protagonist of the do of the story, uh, Rabbit Judy saw a play in her childhood and used the courage to tell everyone that her dream is to become a rabbit police officer. With long time hard work, she succeeded in coming to the dream city and participated in the governance of the city. In the end, rabbit officer Judy discovers that it is an animal instigate and the iris, uh, the iris principle a desire to belong to animals that is destroying uh, the harmony or uh, social relationships between animals and that had been completely anthropomorphic. In order to maintain order among animals, animal wildness must be rejected, or rather, wildness must be domesticated or placed in a reasonable uh, reach, such as placing tiger in the jaws uh, to elevate awareness and then making Tam Tiger and enter the city so as to preserve the order of the city. So, however, the failure of such process is remarkable. So as Nick the Fox, another protagonist in the Utopia, always mandated that uh, the apparatus of a machine because it implies that he could not restrain his bloodthirsty desire at the Fox. This means that popular discourse both includes and excludes animals through its representations of them. Crucially, we find in this discourse a hidden crisis, or rather a symptomatic point here where this discourse is bound to fail the moments when animal desire and anthropomorphic cannot be harmonized and reach a point of conflict. The harmony of the utopia is grounded precisely in this, not treating animals as animals, but praising them as associated with humans Thus, eliminating a fundamental otherness of the animals. This is what utopia really means here. However, it will ultimately fail, and if the zoo could only become a special thing inside the city, isolated from the city, but not the city itself. And here we have law to introduce our the third part. Okay, okay. I will introduce the third part. Yeah, due to time limit, I will be sure. So, so long have we discussed the representation of animals in Western tradition and in the realm of pop culture. Here we have to review the term of representation itself. Representation has long been lambasted, and such really have been can be dated back to at least to the rise of Romanticism. I think who is largely influenced by Romanticism. Oh. In his famous article against metaphysics, the age of one picture, representation is related to subject object problem. Object is put opposite to the subject through representation. And here is very important, which means the word becomes a picture organized around the point of view of subject. And that, from my point of view, is what representation means. And here we can discern the anthropocentrism implication in the term representation. To represent animals, no matter in that way, in what way, is to reduce the animality, animality of the animal and to make sub make subsumes to human beings. For the less representation, which happens through subsuming material to abstract category, is associated with a human-to-human -human common sense, which is doomed to fail to grasp the, grasp the real movement. And in our case, it is precisely the representation of animals that cancels our direct interaction with animals, or in other words, make us fail to grasp the real. The imminent, it's an immediate relationship with animals. So a true solution to the problematic human animals relationship may start from abolishment of representation per se, which we will encourage our being with animals as others. And here, from my perspective, what at stake is the recourse to theory, which provides us a view on the possible coexisting of human and animals. From Jean-Luc Nancy and Blanchot's theory on community to the assembly theory and post-humanist inspired it, and may also include Latour, whose main task is to explore the interaction between human and non-human agents. This theory has one thing in common. They are all against representation instead of the culture, be it traditional or pop. 
Okay, thanks to you. That's all of my representation. Oh, my presentation. Sorry. Thank you very much, Xiao Jin and Tian Ren. Um, we now have um, six um, uh, panelists who are here for your questions. Um, I invite all of you to, the six of you, um, to please turn on your cameras. And, um, and then if audience members would like to raise their hands with questions, um, but I also invite our panelists to have questions for each other. Um, I might suggest by, um, you know, I, I see that Zootopia um, both began and ended um, our, um, you know, our, our discussion today. And um, I think that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear you talk about why you think this film was, a, was, was so important to sort of, you know, as, you know, to be a part of our discussion um, and um, the kinds of, of how you feel that um, films since then have uh, basically um, expanded um, what it accomplished. Um, Satirtho? Okay, I'll start then. I think that Zootopia becomes important because like of how it depicts the animal, the non-human animal and the human animal together sort of in a conflated way. Sometimes they are used as racial allegories and sometimes uh, they are used as like they're ontologically non-human. Uh, and the, I think the importance lies in how Disney has been notorious for depicting non-human animals in various ways throughout the ages, like from Mickey Mouse to the Lion King and to other animated films. And since animation is like the dominant mode of expression for representing the non-human, I feel, apart from the creature feature, I think that Zootopia sort of shows the similarities between humans and non-humans while at the same time making a statement on how they are different. I think the Zootopia can be read for, and since uh, you asked the second question about what media from then after, the, after Zootopia had been dealing with, I think that Zootopia can be analyzed with respect to an anime called Beastars which sort of depicts a similar form of uh, society, but it goes darker where the idea of carnivores or predators are not simply stand-ins for, for human racial categories, but their animality is emphasized, the otherness alter is emphasized. Uh, Chao Jin and Tian Ren, do you have a, a comment to sort of, you know, um, to continue this conversation? Maybe I think Xiao Xin will comment on this issue. Okay. I think he is more familiar to the movie than me. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, we regards this kind of remove at a representation of the popular discourse. And actually for this uh, process, uh, we want to figure out that how the popular culture represents the animals different from the Western, so, uh, um, Western thoughts or from the traditional Chinese thought. And it's kind of a great example for me that because all of us like, uh, all, like the old man, like the young people like the children all have seen this kind of films and uh, they have a lot of thought about it and we can really find in these films that the representation of films are you know anthropomorphic and i think it's an excellent exa example for here and i really like its name you know uh, utopia like the, the utopia of zoo and i, I wonder i'm wondering that why know this film Name itself at the animal utopia, but but zoo utopia. So it's kind of an interesting question, right? Okay. Um, also, I wanted to invite people, if you um, pan, uh, people who are in our audience, if you'd like to ask questions, um, but you prefer to not be on camera or to speak, um, please feel free to ask the question in chat, and then I will 
um, read, read it. Uh, Fabiano and Luca, I wanted to sort of bring you into the kind of theoretics that you that you showed with this. And I, I was interested in terms how you um, dealt with the monster. Um, and I, I, I am I have I'm quite fond of the remake of the fly. And I show you saw that you just saw an image of that. Um, would you like to sort of, you know, expand um, on on basically again this idea of the animal quality showing up as the monster, and perhaps commenting on how that sort of works into the theoretical framework that Tian Ren looked at. Uh, Fabiano, you still muted. Oh, there you are. Okay. And the, the the second version of the fly, we have uh, uh, we have seen the the fly in the made in the uh, uh, thir um, thir thir um, thirty eight, okay, and uh, and so the fly that is uh, uh, more recent in the in there is there is a. a this would be a, a, a difference uh, in the perception of the uh, animal or the non-human animal, but uh, it's it's uh, it's it's the same perspective. We have uh, we have proposed these films that are in the category of monster, that is uh, truly uh, all the history of cinema because there is a, a representation of an old sensibility, if you want, that uh, is recalled uh, by the, by the uh, all, all, <laughs> a, much, a, lot of, a lot of films in the rest of recent films. And so uh, the the change of sensibility we, we proposed in the, uh, um, by means of slow cinema is a, uh, is a, a change of sensibility. And so we have uh, the fly, but we we can propose uh, King Kong in the in the last version. There, there is uh, always a link that uh, um, uh, recalls. The, the ancient sensibility of dominion of uh, no of, of human uh, against the non human. So I think that uh, no, we propose these films that are uh, a, a few films, but uh, representative of the uh, minimal uh, change of sensibility. We are. Um, we we can say uh, we can say as uh, the the colleagues uh, speaks about uh, zootopia that is a representative of the complete uh, humanization we have uh, we have used the mirror the non human mirror of the of the of the human so and uh, uh, and so is uh, is uh, the, the the more the, the most important uh, uh, film in the recent time that uh, have uh, as this uh, sensibility uh, that is uh, that is uh, partial that is uh, that uh, can be changed so, i i think it. i thought not here uh, i can i hear it uh <laughs> Sorry, yes, those buttons. Um, yes, Fabiano. Um, yes, that that difference between the mirror and how how that functions. And I, I like that you ended um, with basically films that basically are experimental and sort of move away from from that framework. Um, and David, I see you um, you you shaking your head. And I know that you had some strong reactions um, to Fabiana and Luca's work. And and it is in some ways the fact that. Um, your your animals, um, as as marvelous as they're trained, they are mirrors both in their performances and and as stars. And I I would love to hear you know you respond more directly to you know to in some ways uh, Fabiano's framework in terms of the films that you looked at. 
Yeah, and I appreciate it. Uh, I didn't look at some of the slow cinema and experimental. I, I have looked at the very beginnings of um, uh, of kind of, I guess, experimental, because uh, they didn't really know what they were doing, but where like uh, the Edison film where they take uh, different breeds of dogs, put them into a, a, a machine with sausages and they come out different breeds, um, that sort of stuff. But uh, Fabiano, I, I, you know, I like... Uh, uh, discussions of slow cinema, which you brought into this, and and uh, I, I'd really like to find out more about your work. Uh, really, very much appreciated uh, you, yours and Luca's uh, pre paper and presentation. But in terms of the the mirroring, you, you know, it was just a, a perfect um, introduction to the way that these films were produced in the late nineteen teens and into the nineteen twenties, uh, where human traits are just conveyed upon these uh, animals and they're talented enough to really pull it off in a way that I think uh, they, they resonated with both kids who love these stars very much, but even their parents. Um, so that's why I think that the, the book Celebrity Creatures, the starfication of the cinematic animal in particular is helpful, but also uh, uh, Brett Mills book, even though it talks about television, uh, animals can definitely be used to study uh, these silent animal stars because they're, absolutely interesting and they have such incredibly grueling schedules that it's it's kind of hard to imagine that um they could be produced in the first place in this way um these these uh animal stars if you don't know and i, I try to to mention this they would go all over the country to promote these short two reel films and then they'd be expected back on the set you know five days a week um sometimes eight hours a day to make these these uh what appear to be rather trivial films but i, I think they're very deep in, in the messages that they are, are sending about uh, our ideals, about what humans are, but also how they can add to our lives in ways that maybe they currently weren't. Uh, you know, they seem to be mostly eating, sleeping, and doing very easy tricks. These dogs were, uh, and dogs and chimpanzees and mules and et cetera, et cetera, were adding value to their, their families and to their communities. You spoke a little bit about what is gained and lost in contemporary films when we move to CGI or a robotic animals. And I, the film that first came to mind is, um, you know, the Eddie Murphy, Dr. Doolittle, where you have animals, but again, they, they are mirrors. They are in some ways humans in animal bodies. Yeah, exactly. And I and, uh, really appreciate you bringing that up, uh, uh, Elizabeth, because these these types of movies where they're using actual animal actors you know almost do not exist there's very very few of this um these types of animal stars that are having recurrent roles their own biographies and so forth uh, that we see from you know week to week month to month uh it's it's just very it's a different time and i i understand why um but it it's using the cgi robotics and even the um where you have the human actor using the mocap is is just totally different it's a totally different uh, uh realm and that that's why I, I i really think these are important films showing um elements of of uh of uh mirroring that you do not see in these robotic and cgi uh films i think there's a one with an alligator coming up as well that's uh totally animated uh, i think of paddington the bear i think of quite a few of these things where it's like you know that's just different from having an actual um, animal on the set five days a week. Um, questions that panelists have for each other. I've tried to sort of, you know, start start this conversation. And again, from from those of us who those of you who have been listening to this this panel, I would welcome your questions. Well, I sort of. Oh, go ahead. okay. David has go a ahead, question, and then Sutira, go, go ahead. So sorry, uh, I was just going to ask uh, what Luca and Fabiano are going to do next uh, with their research, because I find it fascinating. Sorry, um, I include your, uh, your presentation <laughs> for uh, because it, it, it's the, the, the piece uh, uh, missed from the from the history of nearby the, the history of film of cinema. I appreciate this uh, the, your presentation because uh, is uh, the, the origin of the 
Hollywood cinema, Hollywood uh, mainstream cinema. And so uh, uh, each presentation has, uh, has uh, some contribution, important contribution. So uh, we have uh, intention to to uh, to continue the, the the analysis of the of the films that uh, are uh, out of this uh, of this uh, collection because uh, some films uh, some film uh, uh, meanwhile <laughs> arrives to the to the to the screen. Uh, for example, uh, two, uh, two, um, two examples very emblematic of the discussion or, or, or about this, uh, this uh, topic uh, are the um, Lamb, if you uh, Lamb and Borders, two Scandinavian films, because um, we have <laughs> considered only films for, from the uh, uh, particular area of the world, but uh, the proposal, the, inter the interesting proposal are uh, arriving from uh, from these countries, from uh, from th these countries. One is uh, uh, Scandinavian, and another is uh, from uh, is a production of uh, Iceland, and uh, there is a, a great uh, problematic relationship between man, non-human, and human. Uh, Lamb is uh, very, very incredible for the for the conflict uh, between a woman and uh, a lamb. Is uh, you uh, you suggest? Uh, I suggested you would uh, to, to 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 see you, see it. And so we have uh, uh, the intention to consider even the sound of the of the films and the perspective, the the change of the point of view in the in the in the sound of films. Uh, okay, thank, thank you. you. So Tuhro, you had a question? Yes, I had sort of a question for David. Like it's midway between a question and a comment. Uh the thing you highlighted about real animals, CGI animals and robotic animals and the change uh that actually brought to mind free willy and the treat and how the Whale Kai Keiko was in the first film, but uh, after the film was released, there were petitions for it, it to be released, and the sequels made, made do with robotic animals. So I was wondering about the silent films and how were the actual animals, like the behind the scenes treatment, treatment of the animals, if you would know about it, like how were they treated or were the debates about it? Yeah, you know, it, that's a great question, and thank you. You know, the debate really happened um, right after the silent era. There were three sets of um, sound films, uh, Tiffany's Talking Chimps, The Dogville Barkies, and Monkey Shines. And what happened, uh, and, and I don't know if people know the Dogville Barkies, but it's, it's dogs who are, you know, they are not treated particularly well on set because they, uh, when they do a dance number, there's like uh, 12 dogs and they had to use like coat hangers to get them to to um, stand up straight, and then they kind of had to rope them together, which is not is not appropriate treatment. And there was a um, a film, a documentary that came out in England that said, you know, that it was about penguins, and they said they don't use coat hangers. Uh, they they let the animals be in their element, not like those folks in Hollywood. Well, that reverberated because it was a major article all the way back to MGM, and they actually stopped making these films because of that. And then the you know the Humane Society. Uh, gets involved because the mistreatment of horses, you know, jumping to their death. And, and unfortunately, I've got a, an example of one of those films in, a, in a, of all things, comedy, where it's pretty clear they mistreated a horse. Um, um, so this debate kind of happens right after this silent period. I, I would say these animals were not particularly well treated, but they were loved by the public and by their trainers. The problem was the, the schedules requiring five days a week um, eight hours on the set, plus injuries they had to work through. The other thing that happened, if I can answer that question, is that if a dog like Brownie got injured on a set, they a lot of times just fired the dog and the trainer, which is what happened to Brownie. Uh, there, there's some um, misconception out there about what happened to Brownie, uh, but that is what happened because he moves on to a lesser role at a lesser studio. And the same thing happened with Powell. Powell got a little bit old. He gets kind of just fired and moves to a lower 
uh, run on this uh, thing. But if you move to the free will, it's a great point. Um, you, you see there's controversy once the people start connecting with um, um, the actual animal actor and call for uh, things that actually might not be good for that actor. And then they decide to use robotics is what, uh, what, what your point is. And, and it's, it's spot on correct. There's a lot of less, less controversy if you're using robotic uh, performers and you have a much more control. You don't have to worry about having multiple actors and stunt actors and so forth. So I, I think that that's kind of the trajectory, but where it really hit was in the very earliest days of these troop-centered um, animal films that were comedy shorts uh, using uh, questionable practices. Uh, I hope that answered the question. I did. I was actually like wondering whether like, I was speculating on if there is a possible way of recasting these non-human animals again with, in the modern times and if there is an ethical way to do it or something. Like, that's why the question came up. Uh, there, there's a whole now set of rules and ethics, uh, ethical handling, ethical treatment of animals. I, I think they do a great job. But, you know, we kind of saw this come up with a, a dog's life where uh, there was a lot of outrage over something that happened, presumably on the set, and they had to go back and kind of do forensic evidence to say, hey, wait a minute, that actually didn't happen the way it was portrayed on the TMZ video. So, I, I think there's a lot better treatment. It's just that it's so expensive to do and it's so time consuming that I think fewer and fewer animals get work and you can comment on whether or not that's good, bad or indifferent. It's just a, it's just a different uh, uh, realm right now for animal actors and, and trainers. Thank you. Um, Xiao Jin and Tianren, I, I saw in your, um, abstract that you had planned to talk about guardians of the galaxy and i appreciate that you cut it so that you could um you know stick to the time um would you were there some um some points in your reading of guardians of the galaxy um that connected um either to your own theory or to the theory uh discussed by fabiano I think you're still mute. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for that. Uh, actually, we uh, have the gallery of the galaxy since we, it seems like it uh, had an ancient story of, you know, like Robinson who traveled over the world and made a Friday like that. And uh, the gallery of the galaxy is just of sort of like, like a team of Robinson who travel around the, the world. And uh, we, we seem as animals here, like some, uh, you know, like garoots or, or, or the mouse here at a uh, kind of like Friday. So uh, the people uh, like, you know, uh, the people who, who have a team and you know, it's kind of like a team of uh, gallery, but they, they actually actually includes humans and animals. It's just like Robinson and the Fridays. And we want to recognize how the animals like Fridays, like like Rob, like, you know, garoots, uh, what are they really represent here? and how this kind of uh, humanizations uh, here uh, really means. And we want to uh, mention here because uh, we think the gallery of galaxy um, point, point out uh, import, important uh, crisis here because uh, uh, we think uh, it's kind of like a mo movie films, you know, like, like a super, super, uh, superhero, Films here, and we really want to point out that uh, whether the super power of animals they can have, and how uh, how to work to what some extent uh, the superpower is uh, is connected to the animals, animalities, or humanities. I think that connects interestingly to Fabiano, where you know in films uh, previously where you have a hybrid of a human and an animal that basically the, um, the, the contribution of the animal is only to make them a monster. Um, yeah. Where here, um, I don't know that you can necessarily, I mean, um, Rocket, you know, talks, you know, about the difficulties of his hybridity. And again, he was manufactured, um, but you don't get the idea that the 
that his raccoon qualities um, make him um, are what make him nasty or that there there is a problem with that and i think that also the um some of the other characters um yes the um it isn't necessarily that their hybrid qualities make them um more monstrous or less human they basically again add to them okay uh fabiana yeah, yeah, did yeah. you want to uh comment to that uh we, yeah so we have uh we have considered the 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 any the, the monster you know, as the animalization of human from from one side because it, it it's the attribution to to animal that uh, the, the, that uh, the, of all the bad instincts of of human so and that, and from the other side it it, it becomes a you know human animal a a monster it is more animal animalized than the, it is in the in the real in the real time in the in the uh, at the, in the present okay so we have a, a transformation that is uh, an emphasize uh, emph the, the 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 characteristic of human and, the, the, and then we have the, the hybrids, uh, creatures, and other, other, uh, other, uh, other, uh, every every kind of of of, of creature that we, we have seen uh, the history of films, uh, the history of cinema, and uh, and we have uh, 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 this uh, this uh, transformation that is uh, uh, unreal, totally unreal. I think that uh, I I comment here. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so we um, have just a, a few more minutes. Um, I would, if anyone has any final comments or questions. But again, I wanted to thank you for your very strong and organized presentations. It was delightful to see how they um, did uh, speak uh, speak to us. Um, I definitely um, appreciate um, the um, our visitors um, from Asia for um, being with us so late in the evening. Um, but again, um, um, I wanted to, um, you know, again, any final comments or questions, but again, I wanted to thank you all for being with us and for the conversations that we've had. And thank you, Elizabeth, for being such a great host. We really appreciate you. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. You. So thank um, you. I hope that you will look at the uh, other sessions of the conference and we may see each other in the um, audiences there. So be well. Just a quick announcement for those who are Thank still you. here. Oh. Um, Michael, yes. Uh, there will just be uh, the A track in the next session because we only have one paper in the B panel and that moved over. Unfortunately, the paper on animals and Okja will not take place. That has been canceled. So there will just be session A in the next slot. Okay. And again, Michael, thank you for your recording and um, again for um, this wonderful conference we've been a part of. Thank you.